The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so our group is going to call, talk about the uh, accuracy requirements in the mechanical assembly of photonic crystals. And um, so to do so, we'll definitely have to introduce what a photonic crystal is. Um, then Martin is going to talk about the, um, the fabrication process of 3D photonic crystals. And uh, Corey is going to have this little uh, application uh, that he carried out uh, to see the influence of uh, a misalignment in a 3D structure on the, uh, the properties of photonic crystal. So an intuitive way to introduce photonic crystal is to use the analogy with um, elect um, semiconductors in electronics, because photonic crystals are to optics what um, semiconductors are to electronics, which means that um, in uh, semiconductors, depending on the electron energy, you can or cannot propagate a current in it. Uh, in photonic crystal, depending on the, um, the frequency of your wave, you will or will not propagate uh, waves in it. And so to understand this interesting property, uh, you have to go back to Maxwell equations. I'll be quick on this slide, don't worry. Uh, but you know that uh, from the, um, the set of the four Maxwell's equation, you can write it as an eigenvalue problem if you assume that your waves are um, sinusoidal. And now if you introduce periodicity in your uh, crystal, then the block theorem says that you can write the uh, magnetic field like this, where uh, the k vector in, is in the exponential times uh, periodic function, where u is uh, a periodic function, r is the periodicity of the, your uh, crystal lattice. And so the first eigenvalue problem because becomes this one, which can be solved numerically. Uh, which is what uh, Corey uh, uh, has done in the simulations. And you manage to extract these, uh, those um, eigenvalues, which are the dispersion relation between the frequency and the uh, k vector. So if we take the uh, example of a 1D uh, photonic crystal like this, with no periodicity, which means that all the permittivity in the, in the crystal are the same, equals 1, for example, we have this relation, which is uh, proportional. The frequency is proportional to, the, to k. But now, if you take different uh, permittivity in the crystal, you introduce those range of frequency in which a wave uh, cannot propagate. And the width, the size, and the position of those gaps, the band gaps, are a function of the permittivity or the geometry of your lattice in the crystal. Uh, note that we only interested, uh, because of the shape of those uh, magnetic field as exponential of IKR, then we're only interested, and because of the, the, the periodicity in the crystal, we are only interested in this small range of uh, k vectors from uh, minus k over pi to plus k over pi. So to uh, illustrate this interesting property, we brought uh, 1D photonic crystal which can only pass blue light, which means that it, well, the bank, the bank gaps are everywhere where you don't propagate blue. So which you can see if you, if you shine, I don't know, it's going to be easy. If you shine blue light, if you sh shine, sorry, if you eliminate with a white, white, uh, white light, you will, um, you will uh, transmit only blue. Now if you shine, if you eliminate with a red light, then it will block almost everything. As you can see on the second, I don't know if you can see it, but, but basically there's nothing to see. The only problem with the 1D photonic crystal, if you, if, if you shine off axis, then it loses its property. And now you should be able to see this red spot over there. And this is the reason why people are trying to uh, now create 2D or 3D photonic uh, crystals to keep this uh, property in all the directions and with all polarization. The applications of photonic, photonic crystals are, well, as you, as you saw, uh, to filter some of the frequencies, but also to use it as a perfect mirror. Um, you can also use it as waveguides or cavities or uh, 
light shaping. And now, Martin is going to talk about the fabrication. Thank you, Sebastian. So this 3D photonic crystal seems very really interesting, but the main problem is how can you fabricate them? So we can, there are lots of techniques, lots of techniques out there, but we can categorize this uh, in three main categories. The first one is a full 3D fabrication when you, where you create the whole uh, 3D uh, structure uh, all at once, or you can do a point-by-point -point fabrication where you create every uh, single uh, aspect in the crystal uh, by scanning the whole 3D uh, structure, or you can have a layer-by-layer -layer approach uh, to make a whole 3D structure. So the first example of uh, full 3D fabrication is to use colloidal particles. So you can assemble colloidal particles like different ways. You can either use, you can either micro manipulate your sphere to put whatever sphere you want where you want, or you can use a self-assembly pro property of colloidal particles to make a whole stack of particles, and then you can do different processes to make a whole uh, 3D structure uh, that can be used as a photonic crystal. A uh, second full 3D fabrication process uh, is to use uh, what's called holographic lithography. So in this case, you have four laser beams interfering, and they create a whole 3D interference pattern that can, if you shine it, this into a photoresist, you would have uh, some regions which are uh, exposed and some not, and if you develop uh, your uh, photoresist, you would end up having a whole 3D structure that have been made like all, uh, like in three dimension all at once. If we move on now to a point by point fabrication process, we can use multi photon polymerization uh, in the sense where here you can expose a single dot uh, exactly where you want. So in this case, if, for example, if you shine light uh, with a very tight focus point, here you can have a multi-photon multi polymerization in your photoresist that a single photon uh, cannot achieve. And so then if you scan your whole three-dimensional structure, you can make whatever shape you want. And this, is, uh, this can be combined uh, with holographic lithography, for example, uh, where in the holographic lithography you make the whole 3D pattern, and then with multi-photon polymerization, you can put some defects where you want or correct for errors that, that could have been made. But another promising uh, approach is to use uh, layer by layer uh, uh, technique. So this is an example, uh, this is called the wood pie structure, as you can see. So this is done la so layer by layer where you uh, pattern, a whole two-dimensional pattern on your uh, substrate, and then you, you move on building the whole stack. And this here is uh, noticeable. You, we have a FCC uh, crystal lattice when every other uh, layer is shifted by half a period. Another interesting lattice we can form with uh, this layer-by-layer layer approach is a so-called uh, holes rod structure we can see here on the right. And how you can uh, make these is to use the same process of have, patterning each layer at a time and repeating the process, to, and you actually have this multiple layer uh, on top of each other. And with this technique, you can also make defects uh, in whatever la layer you want. You can also use a membrane stacking technique. So in this case, you pattern uh, all your 2D uh, st uh, structure, your 2D membranes, uh, first, and you can make whatever shape you want with defects or not, and then you can stack them together uh, using some alignment techniques uh, that here is used uh, uh, by microspheres. Uh, so basically, you um, you come with all this two D two dimensional structure and you stack them together using this microsphere for alignment. Another promising technique to uh, align and stack this uh, structure is to use nanomagnets on these membranes. And these membranes can help you so first to align uh, each layer uh, on, the, on the others. And also, the magnetic force can be used to break uh, each membrane from the, from the main frame. And if we want to build this, one of these layers we can use for uh, this stacking, uh, a really uh, promising technique is to use coherent diffraction lithography. 
So here we, uh, we shine light through a mask, which is a grating, for example. Um, and you have, your, uh, you have your substrate below at a specific uh, position, a specific height below, which correspond to one of the talbot plane, for example. So here you can see the field below the mask, or you can see different talbot plane. And here is an example of uh, so self-imaging of a grating as the first talbot plane. So, but one of the main problems is this 2D uh, layer by layer fabrication is how accurate do you need an alignment to be between your different 2D, uh, 2D layers. So that's really a big, uh, big problem is the uh, fabrication of this uh, 3D photonic crystal uses this layer by layer approach. And that's why we uh, run some simulation to see how accurate we, we need to be um, in, uh, in this layer by layer approach. I got it. Thank you. Second. All right, thank you, Martin. So one of the structures that Martin mentioned was the diamond lattice, which is just the same as the face center cubic, but there's two atoms in the middle. So what I mean by that is this atom and this atom. This is actually eight unit cells in this picture. Now, this image and this image were taken from a program, MIT Photonic Bands, which allows you to calculate the band gap in three-dimensional structures. For this particular structure, the band gap is 10.62%. And this band gap is actually the range of frequencies here divided by the mid frequency. So that's what gives us these percentages. Now, one of the things that um, we notice is that it's centered about 0 0.42. And obviously, the gap is defined in, in this way. What we are concerned with is what happens if we change this parameter delta. So that corresponds to shifting this sphere, this sphere, this sphere, and this sphere by a, an amount delta in a linear direction. So what we did was we looked at, you know, say it's 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%. What happens to the overall band gap? And so these are the simulations that I ran. And um, you can see that at no displacement, you've got that nice band gap. And then as you shift it by 10%, the gap decreases substantially. And as you go beyond that, the gap pretty much goes away. So one of the things that's curious is what's happening in this you know, 0 to, say, 15% regime. So we ran a finer simulation to uh, give us that and plotted the gap normalized by that maximum gap that you could get for those you know, percent displacements. And you can see that at around 5% displacement, the gap's about 67% of what it was originally. So a small displacement can substantially affect your band gap. And to the extent that you may want that, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but you, you know, need to be aware of it when you're engineering these things. So these are just some numbers that you know, kind of give you a better handle on what that graph means. But you know, I like this one the best. If you want to keep your gap above 10% or 95%, then that's really a displacement of around 1% to 2%, which is pretty small. So a real example of this you know, in the telecom uh, wavelengths and frequencies is, you know, frequency is 1.9 times 10 to the 14 hertz. And if you look at the displacement in nanometers now, so we've multiplied it by our lattice spacing. In uh, Sebastian's slides, this was the R. But in this case, it's 663 nanometers. You multiply the percent by that number, you find that, you know, the bandwidth decreases rapidly as you go out to, like, you know, 40 or 60 nanometers. The bandwidth has dropped almost 50%. So in this case, we might want to narrow the band gap if we want to have like a very, very uh, narrow band filter. But we might want to have lots of frequencies being reflected from this particular crystal, at which point we'd want to be operating over here. So I hope that this gives you a sense for how important misalignment is and how you can use it to engineer your band gap appropriately. Thank you. Questions? Um, one of the things that was mentioned was that certain th fabrication techniques will allow you to put defects in. Why would you want? Is it the same principle that you want? So, if you um, if you add defects into the photonic crystal, 
then essentially you make a pass band in the band gap and light can propagate. If it's like a line defect, you make a waveguide. If it's like a point defect, then light will resonate inside that defect. And you know, there's obviously other structures you could do, but those are two of the simpler ones. Is this for a given thickness of photonic crystal, or is it like an infinite photonic crystal? This is actually one of my big caveats about the simulation. So this software assumes that it's infinitely periodic. And so what I've done here is actually shifted every other layer, not just a single layer. And that's an artifact of the simulation software. If I wanted to try and model just one layer, it becomes much, much more complicated. But yeah, it is infinite in extent. And one of the things that the holographic lithography is limited by is the actual thickness of the photoresist that they can expose. Because after a little while, the light stops interfering in the right way. And you don't get that interference pattern that you want anymore. In real life, how could such a defect come about? So this displacement. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a couple ways, right? Now, one of the things that um, Martin was showing was this coherent diffraction lithography stuff. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit because I know it very well. So you can imagine, you know, if you had your substrate at an angle here, you know, you pass through a few tablet planes. And so the actual shape of your grading wouldn't be just periodic. There'd be regions where you'd go to frequency doubling. There'd be regions where you didn't. So that alignment capability is really an important thing. And if you imagine stacking in the membrane stacking sense, these printed patterns on top of each other, you have to be able to align those patterns relative to each other. And if your alignment is off by, say, 25 nanometers, then you get something like 25% decrease in your band gap. So one of the examples of misalignment is actually in the stacking part of the fabrication. And one of the things that, you know, in this particular case, this stacking is all dependent on how good these spheres are. You know, so the misalignment's not, I don't believe it was reported in this paper, but, you know, it, it could be 20 or 30 nanometers, they don't say. And so that's where the misalignment comes from. But, you know, in Ming Hao's work, in this one, the misalignment comes from the E-beam, right? So as the E-beam's writing, each one of these, uh, each one of these whole layers or each one of these rod layers, there's a certain few nanometers off error that, you know, it misplaces a rod or it misplaces a hole. So I guess the answer to your question is that there's a lot of different ways that misalignment can happen, but it's controlling that misalignment. And if we use diffractive optics, we can control it very well. Yeah. Um, so how does a crystal that's designed for a wider band gap but like has misalignment so you have an effectively shorter one, how does that compare to one that's actually designed for the smaller band gap and is accurately aligned? So I think the answer to the question is if I were designing it, I'd want to go with the one that's designed to have a smaller band gap without misalignment than one that's designed to have a smaller gap with misalignment. Like I wouldn't screw up my pattern to make the band gap get smaller. I'd try and design it to have that band gap. Okay.